This Week on Oklahoma Horizon, where we travel to southeastern Oklahoma to the largest forest area in the state. I think one of the most unique things that uh, we can talk about in southeast Oklahoma is how uh, forestry and tourism coexist. You know, we've got this fabulous, vast forest. Our Rob McClendon sits down with Warehouser's Richard Chapman to learn about the company and their mission. We have more trees now than we did in the 1930s or the 20s uh, ever since they've been collecting data on trees. We go wine tasting and learn the importance of Oklahoma tourism. Over a million tourists a year come to this area of Broken Bow Lake Beaver's Bend State Park. So they were coming. We weren't sure they would come here, but we knew they were coming to the area. And we end our day driving around northeastern Oklahoma on Agritourism's bus tour. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's investment in career tech provides more than nationally recognized technology education and training. It produces solid financial returns for the state's economic future. Oklahoma Career Tech, elevating our economy. And the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. And now, from the Career Tech Studios in Stillwater, here's your host, Andy Barth. Hello everyone, I'm Andy Barth. Rob McClendon is away this week. When most people think of Oklahoma, it's the prairie that comes to mind, with not a tree in sight. But when it comes to our terrain, our state is as diverse as any in the nation. Today, we look at an Oklahoma natural resource by examining one that's both huge and plentiful, our forest lands. Eastern Oklahoma is covered in 5.7 million acres of forested lands, which is known for being one of the most diverse in the nation. But forestry is not just a booming industry, it's a way of life. Joining me now is our Keela Kellen. Well, Andy, when thinking about Oklahoma, forestry isn't something that comes to mind. However, near the town of Broken Bow, people come from all over to celebrate the surrounding forest. Log rolling. Chainsaw races. And even an old-fashioned Jack and Jill competition. His chainsaw, Colin has his chainsaw. Events at the Oachita Festival of the Forest at Beaver's Bend State Park. Dave Smolian is an event organizer. The festival started a little more than 40 years ago. This is the 40th anniversary and it was all designed to uh, celebrate the heritage here in southeast Oklahoma, whether it be the Choctaw Nation or, and or the forestry. And the words Oachito actually are have to do with the forest and the festival as well. So it all ties in together. And again, this was started over 40 years ago and there are a tremendous amount of events and we have a lot of entertainment and there's a lot of forestry events as well, which is really one of the main draws. The festival will draw in anywhere between 30 and 40,000 people over the three days. And it's just a tremendous boost to our economy here in Southeast Oklahoma. An economy that is thriving due to the number of local tourism attractions. Michelle Finch works for the Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry. I think one of the most unique things that uh, we can talk about in Southeast Oklahoma is how uh, forestry and tourism coexist. You know, we've got this fabulous vast forest that, that we're gonna see and in the heart of it, we're, we've got all the cabins and people come here to enjoy the forest. And at the same time, it's a productive forest that's being harvested. We see log trucks coming up down the road. We've got sawmills operating and all kinds of industry. So we're actually harvesting, replanting, and tourists are still flocking here to enjoy this forest that's an actually working productive forest. Forest land that stretches across much of southeastern Oklahoma. There are nearly 10 million acres of, of land in Oklahoma that's forested, which is almost 23% of the state, and I think most people are, find that hard to believe. Kurt Atkinson is a local forester and says that most people are surprised about the impact forestry has in the state. Well, I think the obvious one most people understand already are the wood products that we harvest from the forest. But in addition, while you're managing forests for wood, you also have clean water, healthy watersheds that are tree covered are the highest quality water that you can find. Air quality, carbon sequestration, wildlife habitat, rec recreation, hiking, a lot of different hunting and fishing activities are associated with forest lands. And so there's a whole variety of reasons why trees are important to Oklahoma. 
including tourism. Here at the Forestry Festival, visitors enjoy a part of the state many are just learning about. Tourism in McCurtain County is probably one of our top three industries. It's amazing the amount of folks that are coming in, not just from the uh, Texas area, but now Oklahoma City and Tulsa are beginning to learn about Beaver's Bend State Park, Broken Bow Lake, the Lower Mountain Fork River, and all the things that it has to offer. Even though we're in Oklahoma, we've got the trees, the mountains, the streams, and our tourism is just a huge industry. Contributing more than $2 billion to our state's annual economy. One of the other big things that's happening is uh, a lot of economic development in this area in these woods with lots of cabins being built. And from a forestry perspective, from an economic development perspective, that's an awesome thing. You know, it's, uh, it's generating a lot of dollars for the tourism economy it's, and it's incredible. Making Beavers Bend State Park and the forestry area not only a tourist destination, but an economic and environmental asset to Oklahoma. Oklahoma's forests support an annual $2.7 billion wood products industry, and the forest itself is an attraction to tourists from surrounding states. Well, Keela, it certainly looks like southeastern Oklahoma has become a popular place to visit. What other events are happening around there? Well, Andy, each November they hold an annual folk festival and craft show, and it's really become a popular place to go. All right. Thank you so much, Keela. You're welcome, Andy. And when we return, we'll talk to a representative from the largest forestry company in the nation. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon, featuring some of the good things that are happening in the great state of Oklahoma. Now, Warehouser manages more than 20 million acres of timberland in the United States and Canada and prides themselves in being conservationists, scientists, and environmentalists. Earlier, R. Rob McClendon sat down with Warehouser's Richard Chapman to hear about the largest forestry company in the nation and its role here in Oklahoma. So Richard, give me some idea of just how big the impact Oklahoma's forestry industry is. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's about fifth as far as the agricultural crop goes in Oklahoma. Uh, it's uh, somewhere around uh, probably $20 million, somewhere around and through there, all said and done. So it's a pretty big, pretty big investment. And I think it's interesting that you, you call it an agricultural crop. It's not something that we'd normally think of as an agricultural crop. No, it's generally the same as we do go through the same process as they do in wheat, uh, as corn. Uh, we uh, plant it, we grow it, we fertilize it, we harvest it, and then we make uh, uh, materials out of it. Yeah, so what is the typical life cycle for a tree then? Uh, it depends on the soil type. Uh, uh, our loblolly pines love acidic soils, so probably depending on how acidic the soil is, somewhere between 25 and 28 years. Okay. And, That's and, a long time for a crop. And, and, and you say you grow a tree for 28 years, how, how big is that tree going to get? It'll go from anywhere from 60 feet up to about 80, 85 feet tall. And then once that tree is cut, what happens to it from there? Well, it's loaded onto a truck. Uh, then taken to a sawmill, and the sawmill uh, processes that tree into dimensional lumber. Uh, a lot of the trees are taken to um, uh, the container board mill in Valiant uh, in different places in chips and made into chips to make liner board. So there's different processes and the rest of it is sawdust and that goes to uh, the Oklahoma City market and uh, markets like that for the bedding for all of the uh, cattle and the sheep and the pigs and the different people that show up at the livestock shows. Now, where do you get your trees? Now, Weyerhaeuser owns land itself, does it not? Yes. Yeah, we own 500,000 acres in Oklahoma. We own about 750,000 acres in Arkansas. Total nationwide, we own about 6.1 million acres in tree farms. Now, is that solely where the wood comes from that you use? No, not all of it. We use about 70% of our own trees, and the rest of the 30% we buy on the open market from individuals such as yourself. Okay. Now, what about jobs? Who, who would you be employing in this industry? We'll be employing uh, tree planters. Uh, we'll employ uh, rippers that rip after harvest, that come along and rip the soil ready for uh, tree planting. We'll employ harvesters that come in and cut the trees. 
We'll employ loaders that load the trucks and we'll employ the truck drivers that actually take the raw materials to their facilities to be processed and then the finished products from the facilities uh, to the marketplace. Now, what other worries would your industry have? Uh, I mean, what are some of the factors that you have to deal about? What keeps you up at night, I guess, is my question. <laughs> Probably uh, just the, the, the keeping our em employees employed. Uh, with the downturn in the economy, hard to get financing from the banks. Uh, it's loosening up a little bit. The major inventory of homes, the lack of new home construction uh, and or multifamily homes or remodeling, all those sort of keep you up at night. And then you worry also about your crop, your, uh, your trees that you have growing in the forest. You uh, always worry about wildfires that are happening. Colorado is a good example. All through the rest right now, all those trees are burning up and will have to be replaced at some point in time through natural regeneration. We replant ours, but once you get a wildfire down perhaps in southeast Oklahoma, it could burn a thousand acres. And if there are nine or 10 year old trees, then that's 10 years that you've lost on your investment. And we don't have crop insurance, so we, that investment is a total loss. So we'll have to come in and uh, take, cut those trees down and start the process all over again and start with our seedlings. So was the drought of 2011 that was so hard on farmers in this part of the country, how did it affect forestry industry? It uh, hurt it quite a bit because we had anywhere, we lost all of our young seedlings that we planted last year. They all just died from the drought and that's in southwest Arkansas and in southeast Oklahoma. They're all dead so you have to replant that crop plus uh, a new crop that you harvested in 2012, you also have to replant. Sounds like a very sustainable industry. What would you say to those folks that say, gosh darn, we shouldn't cut down a tree? We have more trees now than we did in the 1930s or the 20s uh, ever since they've been collecting data on trees. There are more forests out there. Uh, and there are no more endangered forests uh, around other than that, that they're already protected. And you know, we grow a crop. It's not like we're out cutting different type of trees. Uh, we have a crop that we do a sustainability on, and that's the crop that we want. We know how to grow it, we know how to replant it, we know how to harvest it, and we know how to get a good finished product to the marketplace. So everything you cut, you replant. That's right. We actually plant more trees than we need because we thin about every 10 years. And we take those thinnings and we send them also, there's a market for the thin trees, and it lets the other larger trees grow up into dimensional lumber trees. But we take the thinnings, use the thinnings uh, that we plant to, uh, for example, liner board mill or make chips out of, uh, things of that such. Well, certainly a, a fascinating industry here in, in the state and across the, the country, and, and one that I think a lot of people just don't quite appreciate, you know? Well, we've, we're, Oklahoma's on the western edge of the southern pine belt, and it goes from Oklahoma all the way to North Carolina. And the, the main tree that is grown down in the south is Loblolly pine, southern pine, southern yellow pine. And in the northwest, it's a different type of tree. It's mainly a Douglas fir. And our headquarters is based out of Federal Way, Washington. And that's the tree that they grow out there is a Douglas fir, which is a huge, large tree. And they go through the same process that we do. Well, well Richard, uh, once again, thank you for stopping by and, and good luck to you and the Warehouser Company. Now Rob continues his conversation with Richard Chapman on our website, where we also have a feature on the history of Oklahoma forestry. Just go to okhorizon.com and click on this week's Value Added. Still to come on Oklahoma Horizon, we tour the Oklahoma countryside. But first, it's girls, wine, and tourism. Well, while forestry is important to Oklahoma, tourism in the southeastern part of the state is almost surpassing it. But not all of the business is local. 85% of the visitors come from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Our Courtney Dioff takes us to a business where wine and tourism go hand in hand. Three best friends and a couple bottles of wine later, three broken bow women decided to pour themselves into the wine industry. Their husbands first. With no experience and nothing but a love for good wine, they became girls gone wine. 
at the worst, we thought we'll have a lot of wine. We can drink the fruits of our labor. We'll sit on our pink leather sofa and uh, watch, Sex watch, in the City. watch chick flicks yeah. and hope we have a customer or two. Try the Michelle Chardin. Finch, Rhonda Reed, and Chandra Ricky are the three friends behind the store yeah. they say is all about having fun. The door. It's fun to come to work. It's fun. It's the time for us three to get together. And it's a place for girlfriends to meet. Okay. And we have um, girls groups come here all the time and kind of schedule mm -hmm. their impromptu meetings, whatever that may be. Uh, and like our label says, a place to, to make new friends, meet old friends, mm -hmm. and have fun. It's all about friendships yeah. and relationships and having a good time with that. Variety. Mm -hmm. I, I think they really From those friendships come one-of-a-kind stories that make one-of-a-kind labels for their unique wine. The most fun has been almost all of that whole, everything we've decided came over several glasses or a glass or two or several of wine. Um, oftentimes around Rhonda's kitchen table in the early days of, we're going to have a red, oh, let's have a road trip red, and we'd make up the name of that particular one. All of the labels are artwork by Oklahoma's official caricature artist, Teresa Farrington and Poto, another woman. That's kind of our theme. So she you would know. send the, she would send the mess. We would send her an email with, um, you know, what is the next idea, and we'd say, well, we kind of see us in a convertible, Thelma and Louise style, scarves flying, road trip red. Everybody I, loves our labels, and and they enjoy it when the new label comes out. I think they're as excited about the label as they are the variety of the wine, and they want to know the story behind each label. Yeah. So right. every every label has a story. My nails are bad. And while every label has a story, so does the wine inside the bottle. So there's that. Uh, we literally rolled up our sleeves and made that first batch, just uh, bailed off into it, yeah, so yeah. to speak. So yeah, we about 400 a... bottles of wine we had when we opened the doors yeah. on April Fool's Day. Yeah, and and so... then we quickly realized we had to start making more. Absolutely. Uh, my husband, Terry's the winemaker. Making beer and wine are a lot alike. He's our wine guy. Wine stud is now what uh, He was the wine him. boy first, and then yeah, we gave him a promotion to wine, wine stud. But he's the one who marched in the door and said, ladies, after just probably a month, maybe, yeah. he said, uh, we're going to have to make wine and make all the wine we can make. And uh, he he's really kept us ahead of the curve. Over a million tourists a year come to this area of Broken Bow Lake Beaver's Bend State Park. So they were coming. We weren't sure they would come here, but we knew they were coming to the area. So we put up two large billboards, Girls Gone Wine, um, and just opened the doors. And literally, people were looking for that something to do after they get off the lake and off the hiking trails. You know, uh, once I heard a tourism conference in Missouri years ago, you just have to have enough cash registers to make tourists happy. Tourists come to vacation to spend their money, and they need plenty of places, places to do that. And so we gave them one more cash register. And as tourists continue to pour into the area, wine isn't the only thing these girls have to offer. And of course, it's just that. The gift shop is a big part of this. Uh, it's a sassy, fun girlfriend's gift shop, and people don't find those ki the kinds of items that are offered in the store just everywhere. To be a collect, you know, we have women that tear through here and just we finally bought little shopping baskets because people's arms were full of gifts and. Um, mm -hmm. It's been crazy. <laughs> <laughs> One crazy idea that turned into a tourist destination, all about drinking wine and having a good time. And our congratulations go out to Girls Gone Wine. They were finalists for the Oklahoma Beacon Award for their philanthropy work with education and animal rescue shelters. Now, while Broken Bow's population is just over 4,000, each year more than a million tourists visit the area. And with all of the new visitors in southeastern Oklahoma, there is a growing need for lodging. Nestled deep in the heart of Beaver's Bend State Park, log cabins dot the roads surrounding Broken Bow. Vacation homes for some and a business opportunity for Chandra Rickey and Terry Walker. The, the amount of money that's been poured into Oklahoma uh, in, the, in the form of these cabins, we started out in the early 90s and uh, with a few small facilities around, but we're up to over 500 cabins. And these aren't just little fisherman cabins. These are real nice uh, two and three bedroom vacation homes. Uh, they're retirement homes for most of these people. Uh, people build these homes and then we rent them for them when they don't want to use them. And then they, they derive revenue from that that basically help pay the mortgage and when they're ready to retire, they'll have a home paid for to move here. Walker says the cabins provide not only a vacation getaway for families, 
but economic development for this area of the state. It's really stimulated the economy in our area, all the carpenters, all the builders. Of course, we raised the trees right here. We've got, I couldn't guess the number of people that work cleaning the cabins, maintaining the cabins, renting the cabins. We spend, our company spends about $20,000 a year just advertising the cabins that we manage. So it's, it's good for the economy. The amount of money uh, in terms of tourism rather, that we generated $9 million last year, it computes to about $56 million a year that we put into this economy right here. Located just three and a half hours from five major cities, Beaver's Bend is a thriving tourist destination. We're three and a half hours from everywhere, so we're three and a half hours from the Dallas-Fort Worth market, from Oklahoma City, from Tulsa, from Little Rock, and from Shreveport. So we're right in the center, and there's been so many people move into the Dallas market in the last 15, 20 years that it's really poured into our area. We're just perfectly located. Oklahoma Horizon is now portable. Just subscribe to our weekly podcast, Visit iTunes.com where you can download our show for your listening or viewing convenience. Each year, Oklahoma Agritourism holds a bus tour around part of the state, which is always one of our favorites here at Horizon. And this year, it was my turn to hop aboard. Get a knee. It's all aboard in northeastern Oklahoma as agriculturalists become tourists. Becca Lasich is the Eastern Region Agritourism Coordinator and says the bus tour is a networking hotbed. The bus tour is just such a great opportunity for people to A, network. I think that's the biggest thing. They sit on the bus, they talk to each other, they get ideas. We have a good mix on this tour of basically existing producers who are already working, who are already successful as agritourism businesses, and people who are interested in starting some kind of a business. So this gives them ideas, they can share ideas back and forth, gives them uh, a, a way to go, uh, just generates a lot of ideas and a lot of support. The agritourism community is really supportive, they share their ideas, they want other people to succeed, and I think that's really what makes us a really unique part of agriculture and part of tourism as well. You have a nice day. Thank you. Well, agriculture is the top industry in the state of Oklahoma, but fruit production doesn't rank high on the list in terms of notoriety. But today, we're at the Livesey Peach Orchards where fruit is abundant. And our next stop is the Stone Bluff Cellars. So we're going to be wandering all over. Oklahoma's so. wine industry has grown significantly over the years. After the Dust Bowl, only six remained in the state. While today, there are more than 50 establishments statewide. Stone Bluff Cellars was originally started. And according to Stone Bluff Cellars D. Selby, a large part of the success is. Word of mouth. Uh, these particular folks are all involved in agritourism industry and so it's also a good way to share ideas and to encourage people and say okay this works for us this doesn't work for us so that's why a, a tour group like this particular one is so good but tour groups in general especially if they're folks who are fairly local they say you know I never knew you were there we're gonna have to go back out there and that just helps business all in all Elaine Flaming is a fellow businesswoman in the wine industry and is a participant in the Agribus Tour. We have always been very interested since the beginning when they uh, invented the Oklahoma agritourism and uh, we've always enjoyed the rolling workshops. Number one, it's networking with other people throughout the state, seeing a different diversification in uh, farming, uh, ranching, Christmas trees, blueberries, blackberries, so it's very interesting. And each tour offers a learning opportunity. Once it blooms. Hearing the diversification and seeing on the blackberries and blueberries, there are some similarities between that and the grape growing that we do, but you still learn a little bit more about the depth of what care they have to give to their berry crop or their blackberry crop and the work that goes into it, which I was not aware of. And that really uh, enforces whatever crop you go into. There's always that knowledge that you need to obtain in order to come out with a quality product. Making connections while rounding the corner to new opportunities. Leading the way in this working and um, now farming is a tough career, but vital for our nation. 
Agritourism allows these families to generate more income by utilizing their existing resources. And as society moves further away from the farm, it gives people the chance to come back to see where their food comes from. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, we're going to examine the health care debate with former Integris Health CEO and now author Stan Hupfeld. The president said we should only pay for what works. And in that case, he was exactly correct. But to get there, we've got to get to evidence-based medicine. Healthcare on Oklahoma's show for the heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, we are out of time for today. I'm Andy Barth. Thanks for watching. Rob McLennan will be back next week. Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. Thank you for watching Oklahoma Horizon.